Um, my name is Jose Alpucha. I'm the CEO in the Ministry of Agriculture of Belize. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this morning, and I trust that your arrival uh, in Belize was uneventful but pleasant. Um, we have a very brief opening ceremony, um, and I'm being told that we will have a little amendment to it, but let me start by welcoming uh, Senator the Honorable Dr. Godwin Holt, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, the Environment, Sustainable Development, and Immigration of Belize, the Honorable Atil Jean Jonas, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Barbuda Affairs of Antigua and Barbuda, Minister, welcome. Dr. Renata Clark, the Sub-Regional Director of the FAO, Dr. Beverly Best the, of ICA, the International Relations, Dr. Adam from PTA, our very good friend Barton Clark of Cardi, and of course, representatives of, of member states. We cannot proceed without acknowledging the Mr. Sean Baugh and the Secretariat team um, for their presence here today, but also for their excellent collaboration with the government of Belize in making this week's event uh, a success. Um, I'm told that we'll have a short, or, or we'll ask for short remarks, which is not on the agenda, from some of the uh, international organizations, regional and international organizations that have actually helped us put this meeting together. And if I could please uh, ask Dr. Clark to come in. Thank you. Honorable Minister Godwin Holt, Honorable Minister of Agriculture for Antigua and Barbuda, Minister Jean Jonah, distinguished colleagues of the head table, distinguished colleagues. This is my first time to a very beautiful and very green Belize. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm very pleased to be here, particularly given the role and function of this meeting. This is my first CARICOM Planners Forum, my first CARICOM Quoted, and I see CARICOM and these meetings as being critical for the advancement of agriculture in the region. So I'm here to learn, to listen, and this will be perhaps the highlight of, of my annual engagements. Agriculture seems to be undergoing somewhat of a revival in the Caribbean. At least there are more and more people, some very highly placed decision makers, who are talking the talk. Momentum is building. Okay? The jury is out on whether we actually go ahead and walk the walk, but we're in a good place at the moment. I hear many people saying that we have under-invested in agriculture in the Caribbean over the years, which means that it would seem that there are entities who are thinking that they need to be increasing investment in agriculture. But if we expect to have good investment, we need to be sure that we have analyzed, we have planned, and we are guiding well. We need to be working together and this is what this Planners Forum is all about, working together to be preparing the way to productive investment. We are all facing major resource constraints, both from the perspective of expertise and funding. 
we do need to be working as one to put agriculture where it needs to be in the Caribbean. I have very high expectations of this forum in driving that clear direction and ensuring the necessary collaboration. There are many problems to solve, many opportunities to seize. In my five months being sub-regional coordinator for the Caribbean, I've heard many of these repeated. So we seem to be aligned in our thinking. We need better data. Better data, I'm told that the Caribbean countries are at the bottom of the pack in terms of submitting and data for monitoring of SDG indicators and achievements of SDG indicators. And we are also among the low performers in reporting on agricultural statistics. How can we plan if we lack that base knowledge of where we are? I'm told we need to improve the competitiveness of agriculture. Many of the countries are small. We can't compete on, on cost and, and volumes. We need to, to leverage technologies. We need to be reducing and minimizing regulatory burdens without compromising the purpose of regulation, particularly in relation to sanitary and phytosanitary issues. There can be no doubt in anyone's mind about the importance of improving resilience and emphasizing disaster risk reduction in the region. Building back better can't just be a useless slogan. We've seen already data, statistics, records being washed away. What does it take for us to invest better and more intelligently in digitalization of agriculture. Problems in relation to obesity. Again, we're racing to the top of the pack in terms of obesity. There's a lot of discussion around policy responses. Youth in agriculture. In the Caribbean, we have, I wouldn't say the fortune, we've worked for it a highly educated population. And we're asking ourselves, how can we deal with the underemployment? How can we get youth back into agriculture? High food imports, how do we deal with this? There are new and unexpected problems coming up. We need to be agile, we need to be creative. Who would have imagined the problems of sargassum? We need to be accessing information, the best information where it exists, and we need to be rapid in finding optimal solutions. FAO, as a global knowledge organization specialized in food and agriculture, has an important role to play alongside CARICOM and its specialized agencies and other development partners. We are committed to interpreting our role in the best possible way. And I look forward to making a lot of ground over the next few days towards where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. And I call on Dr. Beverly Best of ECA. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great, we all here. Excellent. Uh, Honorable. Godwin Hulse, uh, Minister of Agriculture for Belize, Honorable Minister of Agriculture for Antigua and Barbuda, Dr. Renata Pra of FAO, Dr. Benjamin Adon, Head of Delegation for CPA, Dr. Sean Bo, uh, 
head of delegation for CARICOM Secretariat. Other members of the head table, no, I think I missed out um, the CEO, Jose Alcuche, I think I spoke to you very recently on the telephone for the first time. Um, Ministry of Agriculture CEO, Belize. Distinguished delegates, other invited guests, other, I would say, development partners, international partners. Welcome. At the outset, I would like to just take a few minutes to thank the government of, and people of Belize for the excellent arrangement, and I will say very warm hospitality that I received on my arrival yesterday afternoon. It was indeed a very warm welcome, so thank you very much for that. I also want to thank the CARICOM Secretariat for organizing this event of this week, which commenced with this uh, Planners Forum under the theme capitalizing on the new frontier in global agriculture. On behalf of the Director General of AICA, Dr. Manuel Otero, I wish to join all of you in having high expectations for this meeting. Expectations that are heightened by the depth of knowledge, the experiences, and the ideas, and may I say ideas that will be creative or are creative, that are disruptive, and those ideas are all present here and will evolve during our discussions over the coming days. Allow me, therefore, to offer my profound gratitude to the CARICOM Secretariat and other partners that are present you, the representatives, members of our member states, or delegates of our member states and our various countries, and the government of Belize and its people for hosting this very important meeting. I am confident that the presence of all of us here demonstrates a strong readiness and commitment to the theme capitalizing on the new frontier in global agriculture. We can all agree that agriculture is a dynamic industry, always building on the past to create a better future, or a better path forward. Today, digital agriculture has the potential to create a new wave of agricultural innovation that will help growers make better decisions, or help all of us rather, not just growers, make better decisions. Decisions as it relates to business, the business of agriculture, as, as well as agronomic decisions. And these will help us to improve on communication, productivity, trade, performance, among others, and give us various insights and ultimately better results. So in my brief remarks, I wish to reiterate that this forum provides a new or should I say a unique opportunity for all of us to provide our voice or inputs that will positively impact the trajectory, and may I say raise the bar for agricultural development in the region. In closing, I will say this quote, I will make this quote, to go fast, we can go it alone, but to go far, we have to do it together. Ika is very happy to be here and to join in making this forum a tremendous success. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Best. Um, and I call on Dr. Benjamin Adam of the CT. Good morning to all of you. Morning. Morning. All protocol observed. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot go through the <laughs> all the processes that my, my, my partners have gone through already. Um, I'm wearing the shoes, the big shoes of my director, who unfortunately is not here today. He's, in, he's taking part in Pacific 
week of agriculture in Samoa. So I had to step in his shoes. My name is Benjamin Adom, uh, and greetings from Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian, and my first time in the Caribbean, my first time in Belize. And greetings from the Netherlands. I'm based in the Netherlands. I work for CTA as the team leader for ICTs and agriculture. So for those who don't know CTA, CTA is a joint institution of Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific group of states and EU. Our mandate is to facilitate access to agricultural information in these countries. So we partner with EU institutions as well as stakeholders from Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. We, all of us are based in Europe, based in the Netherlands, and satellite office in Brussels. We don't have offices in Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific, so we work with partners on the ground to achieve the goal. Two years ago, we refreshed our strategy for which we decided to focus on three things. The first one is youth entrepreneurship. And with that, we encourage and support youth in these countries to take two approaches. One, the youth that are tech savvy to be able to develop and promote new technologies into agriculture. And then the youth that want to make their hands dirty, those who want to be involved in the farming direct, to also you know, integrate digital tools into their farming activities. The second part is climate resilience or climate smart agriculture. So we promote innovative models and tools and approaches that help build climate resilience for smallholder farmers and fisher folks and others across this um, regions. Then the biggest part of which people know of CTA is digitalization for agriculture, where we promote a lot of these digital tools in agriculture. Again, we, we don't separate technology from agriculture. We, we make the argument that the tools can help transform agriculture. So we, we integrate digitalization into agriculture. We have women and gender and policy as cross-cutting for these three issues. We believe these issues are critical in Africa, in Caribbean, in Pacific, especially in the wake of climate change. And as a result, we push for these tools to be used at all, all levels from policy level to the smallholder agriculture level. We are, part, we are happy to be part of this event, and we, we are contributing to a session tomorrow on propelling digitalization to transform agriculture. We, we managed to bring some of the young guys from the region to come and share their cases, some of the young guys that we work with to talk about some of these solutions tomorrow. So you are welcome to be part of that session. And we, we, we thank all of you for the partnership and collaboration to, to, to help integrate digitalization into agriculture. Once again, on behalf of my director and the staff of CTA, we wish you fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, before I hand over to uh, to Mr. to Dr. Ball, um, <laughs> um, let me complete the the acknowledgments, including an entity that is not here with us today, but I should focus on. Uh, Mr. Milton Horton from the CRFM, uh, Mr. Lynn Le Collins from CAFSA, and the Caribbean Development Bank, although not here with us this morning, they should be arriving, I believe, today.
have also been very, very helpful in putting this meeting together. Um, we cannot move on without acknowledging the University of the West Indies and our own uh, University of Belize, as well as the University of Guyana. Um, we've been joined, too, by our ambassador to CARICOM, uh, His Excellency Lawrence Sylvester. And of course, I cannot uh, go without acknowledging the representatives of the private sector here with us this morning. Dr. Boa, the floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Morning. I'm, I'm pleased to have been given the honorary doctorate on the floor. <laughs> it's an honor I take without any hesitation. Um, on behalf of our Secretary General, Ambassador Erin Larock, I first want to extend our deepest and sincere gratitude to the government and people of Belize. I often joke that this is my home away from home. And when I came out off the plane at the airport, I, that was solidified even more, the level of hospitality that was given. And Minister, um, you have a great team led by the CEO. We want to express our deepest gratitude. Minister with Responsibility for Agriculture, Belize, um, Honorable Holmes. Minister with Responsibility for Agriculture, Antigua and Barbuda, Honorable Minister Jonas. Sub-Regional Coordinator, Coordinator for the FAO, Dr. Renata Clark, Head of Delegation for ECA, Dr. Beverly West, team lead for the CTA, Dr. Ben Adu. I want to publicly express our gratitude from the region and in, in particular the Secretariat for the support and tremendous support that you have given to us to be able to put on this planners forum and by extension the week of agricultural activities. I know we are accustomed to having the Caribbean Week of Agriculture, but because of circumstances beyond anybody's control, we're not having that this week. But the gathering that we are having it today, I, I dare say will suffice, or the week will suffice for the absence of same. I want to also extend welcome to the member states who are here and the ones who are on their way, because without your participation, then it would not be possible. We have been deliberate in our actions for the planners, for this 12th planners forum. It's one that moves away from just talking. It is one that deals with participation, inclusion, and also discussion with, with the aim of demonstrating and adopting practical work of a solution. And the two entities that we have targeted are private sector and the public sector. The intention is to move away from heavy regulation to business facilitation because the ultimate objective is for economic development and regional integration. And what does it best? There has to be some economic activities that is going on and that can benefit our people. Because at the end of the day, the question we ask, how is it that our member states are benefiting from this union that we have? And as a secretary, it is our responsibility to coordinate in a manner that makes it work. And not only work from the political level, but from the very micro level, which is the homes of our, our people. And when that is reflected in their daily lives, then the union becomes even stronger. But with that said, um, we, we invited a presenter, but unfortunately he got some very sad news this morning at breakfast that his mother passed. So unfortunately, um, Ravi Sankar from Caribbean Flavors, he has had to leave us. So I want to ex ex extend and express our condolences to him and his family in this time of 
it's challenging times. I mean, you could just imagine being away and getting news like that. And he did consent to leave his business, leave his time, to come and share with us. So I just want to publicly say that um, I would dare say on behalf of the entire region and the gathering here that we are with him and we offer our prayers and support. Um, it's not for me to talk, but just to say thank you. I think we're going to have an exciting week, exciting session. And not that I'm a magician or a, what's it called, people predict, psychic. But I think everybody will leave with the necessary fulfillment, new ideas, new thoughts that we can take back to our countries and implement. And I dare say, if we want to resign and open our own businesses, we would have met the intended objective. So I say thank you all, and do participate, and have a great week, and a great planners forum, and accompanying meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it gives me much pleasure to ask the final speaker for this brief ceremony to speak, and that's the Honorable Godwin Holtz, Minister of Agriculture for Belize. Thank you very much, Jose, our MC. First of all, I want to recognize the head table, Dr. Clark. Thank you. I heard the word green. That's important. Um, Dr. Bess, thank you. Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Sean, and you accepted the PhD. That's good. And of course, my own CEO, Mr. Jose Alpuche. And I want to welcome you formally to Belize, those of you who have been here for the first time. Dr. Sean is soon to be an honorary citizen. He's been back and forth. And um, I hope he does it before I give up the portfo portfolio of immigration. So. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow the prime minister has chosen to give me these large portfolios, but he keeps sticking immigration at the end, every term, immigration, immigration. Anyway, it's a challenging part of the portfolio. Um, the reception you all enjoyed, which I've heard comments about, comes from my extremely able staff and the staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well, which I hold at the moment as well. So I ask you to please give them a big hand because while, <laughs> because while they were all receiving you and making sure you settle in and so forth, I was at my farm looking at my cows. My staff has done us proud, and thank you very much, all of you, led by CEO Al Puche. The Secretariat has been wonderful in planning these meetings. I know that there have been a lot of interaction back and forth to get everything just right so that we'd have a series of excellent sessions. While protocol has been established, I want to recognize, of course, all my colleagues, ministers from our brother and sister countries. I want to take a moment to express our condolence and with our colleagues from the Bahamas who have just suffered by that very devastating hurricane. I think all of us have examples of what hurricanes can do. Belize is no exception. We had a category five in 1961, which just wiped out Belize City completely and triggered the move to inland where we established our capital of Babopan. It's making 50 years now. That was a terrible time. And in between, we've had several other hurricanes, so we know what it can do. It prompted us, of course, at the WTO in Cancun some years ago to push for special and differential treatment, not because our economies could not reach a level where GDP-wise we could be considered developed but because we are intrinsically vulnerable. Doesn't matter what we do. A hurricane sitting off the coast of Belize that spans from north to south could wipe out every single thing we have. So while in the United States, the devastating hurricane in Florida or Katrina, the war in Iraq continues, the space program continues, 
the interference in politics of Russia and everybody else continues, we are dead. So, so we need to ensure that we remain with special provisions in the trading arena to protect ourselves. Having said that, then I would like to once again welcome you all and to say that this initial planners forum is extremely important and when Jose said to me the Secretariat was looking to move it from Haiti and suggesting Belize, I said yes. He said it's not going to cost any money from our budget. I said oh, because that takes a little doing in cabinet with the Minister of Finance who's the Prime Minister. He's always tight on the budgets. Minister Hulse, what do you want again? Holding a quartet agriculture in Belize. Okay, very good. So thank you, Secretariat. Thank you for all the assistance you've given. The forum sets out to do a number of things. And from where I sit, it's for all of us as stakeholders to discuss continued cooperation on matters of importance to the CARICOM region in agriculture. It's not new. CARICOM is, is it the second oldest trading block or the second youngest? Been around a long, long time. But we still seem to be struggling to get our agriculture to a place where we could be justifiably proud. Today's discussion then should leave us with action plans, or at least the thought of action plans to be implemented to enhance agriculture and food production within the region. And of course, focusing on agriculture and food production as a business, as a business. It's the time for subsistence farming and self-sufficiency has long gone. People, young people especially, are morphing away from agriculture if it doesn't offer them any sort of serious financial rewards. And so we would be relegated to even more massive importation of the basic commodities. Thereby, if we focus on it as a business, we could reduce our regional food importation bill, which is still extremely high, and promote extra regional exports to grow our economies. In this regard, we must consider the implementation of digital technologies in our management and production systems. And I heard that both from Dr. Clark, I heard it from Dr. Bess, because today's young person has a cell phone 24 hours. Long, young ladies walk around with it in their back pockets. I don't know how they don't get it snatched away, but that cell phone is an integral part of our attire. And therefore, you're not going to get any young farmer with a machete and a hoe and a rubber boots and an old straw hat without his or her cell phone. In that regard, CEO and my colleagues in the ministry embarked on a program two years ago which aimed at doing just that. And we created the BAMES program, Belize Agriculture Information Management System. And it is managed by two able staff, including that beautiful young lady over there, Miss Milagro Matos from Belize. Give her a big hand. We set it all up. <laughs> and all I wanted to see of the BAMES program was whether our personal family farm was registered and what we had on it, and they could show it to me digitally. So when they did that, I said, well, must be working. What it aims to do is to capture every single farm in this country. And so far, we've had substantial success. We've registered some 8,000 plus farmers and a combined acreage of about 450,000 acres on the production of everything from bananas, citrus, fish products, shrimp, rice, all the grains, poultry, cattle, sugar. And it was timely because this year Belize suffered and is continuing to suffer one of the worst droughts it has in a long history. The last drought in, I remember was 1975, when many of the rivers ran low, some of the lakes completely dried up. And so this drought has put 
a devastating toll on our agriculture sector. And we estimate some 50 plus million dollars worth of losses. But what the BEMS program did was it gave us a digital handle on who suffered, where he or she is located, what he or she lost, and enabled us to trigger some relief to CDB, IDB, and the government of Belize. So it's an excellent tool, and we're continuing to work with it. Another tool that we are beginning to employ is a marketing tool where, and we have contracted some very bright local entrepreneurs to develop these digital apps that you can, the farmer can go and the potential buyer can see what he has, can see how the potatoes look or the tomatoes and where it is and how much he has and what price he has and that sort of thing. So the marketing can happen from the farm straight to the table without the need to run the products into a market and suffer from the problems that we all know happens when you try to market in that particular locale. So we're working on that as well. And that is the digital part of technology. And we hope for it to go further. Because we're also about to launch our LIDAR coverage of the country so that we can determine the topographical maps, the highs and the lows, and be able to better plan particularly for droughts or excessive flooding as we had in last year, January. That's terribly important because then we could advise the farmer where to plant what and when and how. So we're going down that road kind of post haste as well. The other area where I think this forum will be very important is how we bridge the gap of market access through the creation of linkages, particularly at the private sector level. After all, it's the private sector that trades. And all of us around here, we plan at the public sector level. But the buying and selling happens between producers in Belize and buyers in Jamaica, Trinidad, Dominica, and vice versa. Governments don't sell anything. We put that legal framework in place, all the cooperation documents. We create these institutions, we create what we call dispute settlement mechanisms. And in any and every dispute settlement mechanism, really the only people who win are the lawyers who have big fees. And no matter how you settle it, they win from the start. But the farmer on the ground wants to make sure that he can sell his product, he gets paid, and vice versa. The importer wants to know that the product he imports is of good quality and he pays and can sell it. That's the bottom line. We need to develop or adapt more efficient production technologies. That is important because the developed world is racing way, way ahead of us. I spent a lot of years on my, in a previous life, let me call it, before I was minister of anything, actually physically farming. And I could remember the days when we crop dust and we sprayed and we had to be twisting our necks off to make sure that we would catch the right weeds with the right chemicals. Today a computer does all of that. I recently visited a farm and the operator in the tractor had on a television screen and headphones and he had programmed the tractor. The tractor was going by itself. It was spraying the various weeds by itself, whatever it reached whether that was Tissel, Johnson grass or whatnot, he just ejected the correct spray there, turned around and came back. The young pilots who fly these ultra-modern crop dusters, they don't have any flagmen any longer. Guys who would be waving a flag so you'd fly straight and then they have to dodge when you pass over them. This is all done by GPS and modern technology. And we can't hope to even begin to compete with our products if we don't try to catch up on some of that technology. And so we have to form the linkages because our economies are small, our farms are small, and no one farmer can afford to invest in any of this kind of equipment. So this has to be some sort of cooperation where we could have the equipment accessible to all. We will also discuss, hopefully, support for agro-processing and value addition at different stages of the food production chain. This enables inclusiveness of all groups, including women and youth, 
in the food production, food preservation, food preparation, and of course the thing we all do, food consumption. And those are the stages we are going. In our ministry, we are a little more than toying, and I hope we do it before the term of this government is ending. Changing the name of the ministry from the Ministry of Agriculture, Agrarian Culture, to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in align with the FAO. Because we believe that to highlight food is terribly important. There's this thinking across my colleagues in cabinet, and I guess the same in the region. Oh, tourism is one of the major pillars. Oh, manufacturing we should go, etc. I continue to suggest that food is the major pillar because without it, we won't have anything else. So we want to highlight that particularly when it comes to budget allocations at budget time. Of course, and perhaps the most important is the analysis of and practices to adjust to the changing climate. Because our traditional methods of food production in the field is no longer sustainable with unpredictable rainfall, rising temperatures, rising sea levels for coastal communities, new pests that have somehow managed to spring up overnight and plant and animal diseases. We need that because the only constant is that we must have nutritious food for our ever increasing populations. And I know the term has been bandied around climate change. You notice I never used it. I said changing climate because I don't want to, us to get into that North American discussion of whether it's climate change or not climate change and all of that. I can tell you we have a drought. I can tell you the rain is coming different. I can tell you that my mango trees are putting out blossoms now which never happen. And I can tell you that my cortex tree which normally blooms beautifully in April is blooming again. So the trees are telling us that things are changing, whether we like it or not. And when I look at vibrant and very productive sugar sector up north. 30% of the crop is dead, and another 20% is struggling from the drought. So things have changed, regardless of what word we put to it. And I don't want to say that we are going to fight climate change, or we have to find some means to combat. There's no point in trying to fight Mother Nature. That's wasted energy and never going to win. So what we need to do is find a way to work with the changing climate and changing conditions. In that regard, in Belize, we are pushing ahead with our greenhouses. We're looking at different mechanisms to be able to irrigate our crops, particularly catchment basins. We're looking at some elements of regenerative agriculture, better plant cover, silviculture, and there's an aggressive approach in the ministry to deal with that, because that is how we manage to work with Mother Nature and whatever she brings. And indeed, drainage goes hand in hand with irrigation, because you either have too little water or too much water, and we need to ensure that we manage that. Surprisingly, this whole push in the ministry is not from the top down. It's not out of our glorious PhD minds, but really it's from the bottom up. At one of our regional agriculture shows, a small farmer came up to me and he simply said, Bass, oh no, no, they do nothing for me. And I'm sure you all understand that. Because all of my watermelon drowned. And I said, well, how can we do anything for you when we didn't know you exist? And we don't know where you are. I said, and that's why we are going to launch a program to register you so we will know where you are. We're going to push our LIDAR program so we could tell you in advance you're planting in a valley. And if it rains, the watermelon is going to drown, as you put it. So the impetus and the idea has come from the bottom up. Cattle farmers who have said to us, I can't take my cow in no vehicle down to Belmopan to no vet. And when I try to get the vet to come to my place, that's a nightmare. So now, if we can get him on his cell phone to show his animal and link him up with our Baha people, I see Dr. De Paz at the back, and all our veterinarians, and they can semi-diagnose, and then somebody can come out 
It's a tremendous advance for him. And that's where we're going. To this end, then, ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude by simply saying, let's get growing and let's get to work. It is our mandate as planners to ensure that the man, the woman, or the youth who toils in the field is supported with proper, relevant know-how, has a market for the products of his or her labor, while being able to withstand all the changes that Mother Nature throws his or her way. Thank you very much. Welcome once again, and have a successful meeting. Thank you very, very much, uh, Minister. Um, before we have a very brief break, I'm being asked to remind presenters with PowerPoint presentation to have them loaded on the laptop ahead of time. Um, they should be given to Mr. Horace, who is at the middle desk there, um, to facilitate a smooth running of our next session. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you all from the head table for your inspiring words and setting the stage for the next day and a half uh, interaction. Thank you very much. We have a very short five minute break just to rearrange.
quite frankly, uh, and we've got to catch up uh, time. If we could please start um, with CARICOM Secretariat and one of the the uh, or the key uh, point we're trying to look at in these initial presentations are the strategic interventions that and and uh, cooperation programs uh, with the various uh, entities. Without saying much more, uh, Sean, could you please go ahead? Thank you, CEO. Good morning again, colleagues. Good morning. Today, the Secretariat will present on the Caribbean Community Agricultural Policy. But before I do that, I, I thought it would be prudent for us to look on what I would call the governance structure or the stakeholders within the regional setup as it relates to agriculture. So I'll do two quick presentations. I'm aware that we are behind time, so I won't spend long on the first. But I think contextually, I, I, it will be of benefit because I know there are some new persons who, are, who have come on board since we last met in 2018 for us to understand how the structure or how it has been um, constituted and so we relate within the region from an agricultural point of view as agreed and put forward by quoted. Um, can everybody see the screen? All right, I, I, I would ask you to, well firstly, there are essentially three regional policies that we're pursuing in the region and the CARICOM secretary manages. But two is a subset of, the, of one. So the overarching policy is the community agricultural policy, we call it CAP for short. And the other two are the regional, take me back to the first, Take me back to the first slide, the second slide. Go again. Press up. No, 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 we're not there yet. But I'll speak until you get to it. The second is the regional food and nutrition security policy. And the third is the, re is the regional fisheries. Still take me to the other one. The second slide, that's it, is regional fisheries policy. <coughs> there, are very, there are various technical committees that the region through the quoted through the secretariat operate through. First, there's the CARICOM CVO's committee and the chair of SAME, Dr. Selvin Meloni, who is from Montserrat, is here. If you could just raise your hand up. So he's the chairman of the CVO's, the CARICOM CVO's, and CVO refers to chief veterinary officers. Then there's the CARICOM plant health directors. For short, we say CARICOM PhDs. And there's a CARICOM regional organization for standards and quality, what we call CROSSQ for short. Then there's a coordinating group for pesticide control boards of the Caribbean, and we call them CGPC for short. Take me to the next one. <clears throat> no, you go in the other. I think you back and forth, but let's go through. Now, we are organizing what is called thematic groups. So you would imagine and you appreciate that agriculture is a wide discipline that covers a lot of areas, a lot of topics. So we have grouped them into four thematic areas. The first being climate change and disaster risk management and natural resource management thematic group. That is now chaired by FAO, correct? and supported heavily by the other members as listed there. There's Sedema, there's the five C's, the Secretary, there's AICA, FAO, as I said before, the OECS Commission, CABA, CAFAN, and also the CRFM. There's the Business Development Thematic Group that is chaired by ECA and the members are there as we suggest business development thematic group that deals with marketing, deals with business side of agriculture, agribusiness development and so forth. There's the health, agricultural health and food safety thematic group. 
and there's a human resource, research and human resource development thematic group, and that is chaired by CARDI and also heavily supported by the universities. I should also mention that agriculture in the region is organizing what we call a food and nutrition cluster and that is chaired by CARDI and all the thematic groups essentially would receive the mandate working through that cluster and that cluster is a partnership of all the development partners also. There are several real commodity, group, um, commodity groups that we have now and there are roots and tubers, small ruminants, herbs and spices, fish and fish products, coconut and recently we've added sugar as the other. There are several organizations, and I'm moving quickly, that are, that are constant and who work throughout the region. And uh, it's not exhausted or limited to. But there's CARDI, there's CASA, there's the five Cs, there's Sedema, CXC, and I'm going faster. There's the OECS, there's the CTA, there's AICA, there's FAO, there's CABA, and also we have CAFAN, which is CAFAN and um, CANROP. And more importantly, also, we have the Sugar Association of the Caribbean that deals with the matters of sugar. So that is in a very brief presentation as the context as it relates to the governance structure and how it is organized throughout the region. And I think it's important that we understand that firstly, as I go inside of the Committee Agriculture and Policy, it will create a, a, give a better picture as so take me to the next presentation as to how it is organized, especially for the new members who are here. All right. Now, the point of agricultural policy, the background and the rationale. Simply put, the strategy aims at strengthening our regionals agricultural production base. And by this, the overall direction is to reduce the level of imports as it relates to food, enhance food security, job creation and employment, creation of same, and at the same time creating an enabling environment that promotes private sector investment. And again, Economic growth mostly comes through private sector involvement, and that's a model that the region embraces. So even this planners forum that we have here, it's aimed at getting private sector more involved in the entire process. I'll just skip that. The vision as outlined here is one to sustain a broad-based and balanced development of the agricultural sector in order to ensure food security, economic growth and of the agricultural sector, and to protect the natural resource system, improve rural livelihoods, and build an internationally competitive agricultural sector. And the rest is there as to what the outcome of that should be. But essentially, that's the vision of the CAP. And it's supported by a mission that outlines pretty much which is the heart of the, the, the movement, is to harden, harmonize, integrate target objectives through the various strategies and programs undertaken by country and other intergovernmental organizations in the region. And particularly with respect to regional food and nutrition policy and the common agriculture, the common fisheries policy. Goal of the policy. <clears throat> we wanna, the policy seeks to develop agriculture, fisheries, and forestry in a regional, from a regional perspective. So we're looking at creating an enabling environment for efficient production of agricultural products. And products deals with fresh produce. It, deals, it also encompasses livestock, even though it's not mentioned there and it deals with the value chain, that's agribusiness and so on. Promote increased vertical and, in, and horizontal linkages, efficient management of sustainable ex, and sustainable exploitation of the regional natural resources. And given what now exists with the realities of climate change, this is more important than it ever was. 
Given the realities that we have that we want to grow our economies, this is more important. Because natural resources, once they go, that's it. <clears throat> the CAP, as we call it, have five main pillars. The first one deals with food and nutrition security. And I'm not calling it in any, any particular order. This production tri trade along the value chain. There's rural modernization and youth programs, sustainable development of natural resources, and a modern agricultural and information system. What does all of this mean? Nice fancy words. I think I pressed too fast. Food and nutrition security, that pillar. This is embedded in the regional agricultural food and nutrition policy that was from 2011 to 2025. Just out of curiosity, could I see a show of hands who, who are the member states or persons in the room who are aware of this policy? Less than 50%. So it says to me that there's a lot of work to be done. What I've done in the meantime, we've provided copies of the Community Agricultural Policy, which is over to our left. And to segue a little bit, this is the importance of the Tanners Forum, because for us to get where we want to go, then everybody has to be understand what the base is. Um, moving quickly, to improve the, the nutrition status of the Caribbean population, particularly as it relates to NCDs. We would have seen, we've launched what's it called, Caribbean Moves. Ministries of Health are now partnering more with Ministries of Agriculture, promoting healthy lifestyle, healthy living. This is the objective here. I mean, my grandparents lived till they're 91, one is now 95, and they ate regular food, drink regular water. All of their children, except one, are dead. I mean, they die from cancer, they die from diabetes, you know, because of the, the lifestyle that we now live in. So the policy seems to see how best we can promote a nutrition, a better nutritional status for our population. So still, the development of natural resources, and again, this is in the context also of climate change, encourage the promulgation of agriculture and land utilization policies in member states. There's a real challenge happening now with development. We're putting up a lot of concrete, but we're island states. We'll run out of land. And if we're going to promote food security, then we have to find that balance where we introduce technology, we introduce new production method, but at the same time, we're not giving up our, all our prime agricultural lands to build houses. Additionally, in line with the regional fisheries policy, to promote an effective sustainable management and development of the region's fisheries. There's a, a lot of talk about, uh, there seems to be a, around this presentation now in the end. I think in editing, we probably just edited too much. But we talk about the blue economy. Well, what is the blue economy? We know, luckily for us, we're now having the the high level meeting between the, the CARICOM ministers of um, fisheries and the, uh, what is it called, OSPESCA and SICA. And the Central American countries share the same coastal line or coastal waters, better yet, as we do in the Caribbean. So that's something we really, through our fisheries policies, have to manage. And all the ills that come with it from piracy, from IUU, from exploitation of the natural resources inside there, how we do our fishing, and so on. How best can we get involved now in the various, what they call it, pelagic fisheries that take place? Because there's real money to be had there. And led with the CRFM and some interesting presentation that will come today, it, no, not today, tomorrow, we shall see that it's not difficult moving too fast. <clears throat> Production, tr trade, and value chain development. And this is important. Identification of priority commodities, improve efficiency and competitiveness of targeted chains, and promote greater investment in the agri-food sector. I'm moving too fast. Hold on. Where's the youth one? I'm not 
not sure what's happening here. Rural modernization and youth programs, I mean, it speaks for itself. Increased participation of youth in agribusiness. Um, I think it was Dr. Clark who spoke about it this morning. And we were deliberate with some of the participants in here. Youth in business, youth in primary agricultural production, youth in agricultural agri um, advocacy and promotion. So we've invited participants because we want to highlight what is happening. This is part of our policy. Increase the participation of women in agribusiness. Coming here, I was pleased to be listening to some of the participants talking about the various issues that affect women in agriculture. And, and while I don't want to take away from their presentation, I hope they don't be upset with me. It was a very interesting topic, and it had to do with sexual harassment of women in agriculture. And I said to myself, I've never thought of that. And it's interesting. And these are issues that, if we're going to get women more involved in agriculture, then these are issues that we have to look at. And the cross-cutting issues, finance, climate change, institutional development, and gender. Now, what have been some of the positives to date? We managed to successfully set up a lot of the governance structures, as I mentioned before. We have excellent international partnerships with our partners, who are development partners who are here. And also, we've been good at developing model legislation just for the member states to adopt them in the, region, in the national level. That harmonizes pretty much how we go abroad plant health, animal health, and so on. What have been some of the challenges? <clears throat> one, finance is one of the major challenges. Because if we were to really pressure test how much we achieve, we see that a lot of the things that we are not achieving is because we lack resources. So we've had to really prioritize. I mean, everything is important, but you can only move as fast as resources, whether it be financial or so on, allows you to do. Lack of harmonized procedures, it is killing us. It is killing us, it is crippling us. It is preventing inter-regional trade. Also, there's a challenge between national versus regional priorities, and this is a real issue that has to be dealt with in a serious way. We speak about the importance of being together, but sometimes the national priority retards that. And until we're able to better look at the numbers and see how best an expanded relationship can benefit us, it, it has been one that has been keeping us back. Um, there's one that is there, limited political will and also limited private sector involvement. One of the things that I found interesting in my six months here, I used to be around the table here with everybody criticizing, and I used to be hard. But one other thing I found is that the level of private sector involvement in implementing the CAP has been limited. So we need to bring that up. As we relates to the way forward, I'm going to move quickly because I know I've taken a lot of time. Development and implementation of regional projects and programs. And what do I mean that? Things that are tangible, things that member states can feel, things that member states and our citizens can say, hey, coming out of the cap, this has made our lives different. This, had, had, this has caused value to come to our lives. We have been doing, over the years, a lot of studies. But I think we now move, need to move into investment. And there are common investments that, that are useful. We can invest in labs. We can invest in food safety issues. We can invest in transportation. Things like that, that brings tangible results. And finally, we need to rethink how it is that we have the level of commitment from member states. I mean, we talk about that we want this done, we want this to take place, but again, each one of us have to say yes or no. And I find that the level of um, commitment from our member states, and by extension, uh, what's the diplomatic word, from the main players have been less than, than expeditious. Because time is money, and money is time. And 
It costs more to do nothing than it costs to have something done. Um, I think I'm pressing the wrong thing. I've learned the technology now. So I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Um, I believe there's 4.8 billion reasons why we need to move quickly. Um, and that's the number in US dollars of the food import bill for the region. Um, but as Sean pointed out, a lot has been achieved, but a lot more needs to be done. I think what is critical in attempting to, to meet those 4.8 billion reasons, um, we absolutely need to begin moving at the speed of business, not at the speed of bureaucracy. Um, so I would really want us to keep that in mind as we listen to the presentations uh, going forward, because at the end of the day, you all are the people that help and have a very big hand in the formulation of domestic and regional agriculture and food policy. Without saying more, I would like to call the representative of ICA uh, to present to us Dr. Kurt Delis, Special Affairs Coordinator for the Caribbean. Thank you, Chair. And let me just recognize the colleagues here, um, as has been established. Um, I'm going to be presenting basically the, our regional program. Um, we do not have a lot of time, so I will be basically rushing through. In the plenary, if there are any specific issues, um, we could go more into detail for clarification. So without much further ado, I would like to start. Thank you. OK. Um, sorry, there's a lot of talk of technology. So yeah, basically, um, with just a representation of ICA's um, mandate, the regions that, that are incorporated in, in, in ICA's um, geographic scope. Just briefly, um, ICA's mission and, and, and vision, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. It is available on our website. Um, under our medium term plan 2018 to 2022. The strategic objectives which, which guides ICA's technical cooperation agenda, we have four strategic objectives and I'll just go through them briefly. Increase the, the contributions of the agriculture sector to economic growth and sustainable development. Contribute to the well-being of all rural dwellers. Improve international and regional trade for countries in the region increase the resilience of rural areas and agri-food systems to extreme events. I think what is of note for this specific medium-term plan is that we have aligned the strategic objectives with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Um, the, our program, ICA's technical cooperation agenda is basically divided into four broad program areas, bioeconomy and production development, the territorial development and family farming, international trade and regional integration, climate change, natural resources, and management of production risk, agricultural health, safety, and food quality. We have two cross-cutting themes, and you'd see a lot of reference has been made to them. This is gender, I think it's time. Um, 
gender and youth and innovation and technology. And the whole framework is based on an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the modalities that we employ, building scenarios and support for the creation of development strategies, technical and operational support for mobilizing human and knowledge resources. The mobilization of external resources is a critical factor. The management of the resources based, um, provided by the member states. The responding to the requests through rapid response and short-term actions. And the horizontal cooperation among countries particularly the South-South cooperation, which is critical to this term of the current direct uh, general of ICA. Um, for the Caribbean in particular, the director general has designated the Caribbean region as a priority region um, under his mandate. And the five program areas and the two cross-cutting themes that I referred to, um, we have also developed two differentiated strategies for the Caribbean region, taking into account the particularities. One for the broader, the broader Caribbean region, but also recognizing the peculiarities of the smaller member states in the OECS. We also have a, a differentiated strategy for that region, that sub-region, which takes into account this and try to address some of the unique um, vulnerabilities of, of them. And within that framework, we have also developed a regional monitoring mechanism to ensure that we are responding and delivering on the, the result areas that have, been, that have been agreed upon. Um, although we have five program areas, a lot of our focus are based on, on three critical areas for the Caribbean region. So a lot of the actions you'd see that we engage in uh, basically falls within these three priority areas that we are defining for the region. And this is climate change, resilience, and agriculture disaster risk management, agricultural health and food safety. This particular is also heavily skewed towards trade facilitation and agro-rural tourism and agribusiness and trade with Sri Lanka as, as one um, thematic priority area. Okay, um, I'm just going through quickly some of the ongoing and prospective technical cooperation initiatives for the region. I think some of them will be the focus of some of the, the sessions that we have. So just to reference the city areas that we are currently working on. Um, building resilience, natural resource management, agriculture, disaster risk management. And some of the work we have been doing, climate smart agriculture, protected agriculture systems, soils and water management, as key, key elements of it. Ecosystem-based adaptation, we are currently awaiting approval of a regional project um, in that regard, which will be executed in, in, in a few of the countries in the region. The Global Center for Agriculture Resilience, the Commonwealth for Dominica, which would provide services for the entire region is a major um, aspect of this mandate of the Director General, and we are working assiduously to achieve that aspect. We could all understand why I think the Minister made a reference to our sister island, Bahamas, so we could see the, the need for that kind of intervention in the, in the region. The issue of water security is very critical for us. A lot of what we're speaking about, you also heard reference to the droughts. Not only water for consumption, but more critically, water for agriculture. The strengthening institutional capacities for ADRM, we are currently doing a lot of work with FAO along these lines. And another interesting component, and I think um, Sean made reference to the blue economy, sustainable approaches, approaches for developing coastal wetlands as a critical component. Strengthening agriculture, health, and food safety systems. And here, a lot of our work I get to is promoting standards and food quality for, for trade facilitation, building local capacities in agriculture, health, and food safety through Codex Alimentarius. Essentially, ECON manages a lot of the interventions funded by USAID under the Codex Alimentarius for the region. Um, strengthening national and regional coordinating mechanisms for H for agriculture, life, and food safety. 
Also, we, we provide a lot of support in strengthening institutional capacity to manage agricultural life and food safety systems. And a critical aspect, which is uh, to a large extent an emerging issue in the region, is the issue of building capacity in biotechnology and biosafety. We hear a lot of issues and concerns being raised about GMOs and the incorporation of GMOs into our, our food systems. Agribusiness and trade. Um, a lot of our work here get towards strengthening regional international trade platforms. And just as a matter of example, um, we have been working to ensure the fine flavor status of cocoa with the international cocoa organization. Um, we have also been working with a number of the, the countries in promoting opportunities for trade under the, the EPA. And we have concluded diagnostic study and notifications to the, to the WTO. We're hoping to help countries in, in meeting and, um, these notifications to the, to the WTO. Also, we work along the lines promoting access to regional and international markets. Um, building on studies related to business facilitation is a key component of that. Um, another critical component, strengthening capacity of agri SMEs for trade in local and regional markets. We just conducted a pilot in Trinidad and Tobago in that regard. We hope that it could be introduced um, to, to some of the other countries, member states of ICA. Um, we have also been collaborating with Caribbean Export on UFone Agri Enterprises to see how we could boost um, local and regional trade along this line. Value chain development, another critical aspect. And essentially, what we have recognized is the need for vertical integration in the agriculture sector if, if it is to bring added benefit to, to a number of our countries. Um, we have been working along with the government of Argentina on an initiative called AP Caribe, where we're trying to strengthen honey production and other products emanating from the apiculture industry. We have done Dominica and Barbados. We will be looking at some of the other islands um, before the end of this year. Um, we have also been working heavily along the lines of Puma apiculture, allowing the need for more environmentally responsible ways of, of, um, of producing um, honey, but also the sustenance of the bees themselves, which are under threat. Cassava, a major component of our first and value chain development. The, we have been working on a cocoa multi-stakeholder platform. We're also going to be um, working towards a regional project for cocoa as well. Another aspect is also promoting linkages between value chains via blockchain concept particularly in addressing delays in payments to farmers by buyers. Um, the other aspect, and it is, it is one you would have seen it in the, in the presentation of, of, of Mr. Ball, coordination support to the business thematic group on CABA. CABA and ICA, we are working on developing the herbs and spices industry at the moment. Um, the Caribbean Agriculture Development Forum, this is a forum launched by the Director General of ICA, which brings the private sector individuals from prominent private sector institutions who work to advise ICA and provide recommendations to ICA on its technical cooperation agenda, how to boost private sector activity within the agriculture sector. We believe that's a critical to achieving our goals in that regard. Um, promoting the bioeconomy, another emerging area for the, the region, um, we have developed a regional waste management project, how we could deal with the issues of waste management, but at the same time, propose models for the countries which could, in, could increase road employment and generate additional sources of income. I, made, me, I heard mention of the Sagasam. It would fit perfectly within the framework of, of that regional proposal that we have been, um, that we will be promoting with the countries. And, with CARICOM, we have also been able to develop the consultancy for regional policy for the importation of animal and animal products. As food and nutrition security, we work heavily in sustainable agri-food systems, um, promoting family agriculture and its insertion into mainstream marketing and distribution channels. Um, 
we were given a mandate at the, at the last CODEC to, to the issue of linking agriculture to nutrition. We have the, um, established a CARICOM biofortification network, and we have developed a biofortification project where we really represented at the CODEC for endorsement. And another critical component of it, the diversification of the rural economy. Agro-tourism, rural tourism development, we look at it as a critical component which we believe could bring significant benefit to many countries in the region. And basically we're looking at things like culinary tourism, heritage tourism that we have not um, been able to capitalize on in the past. We believe these are areas that we could bring significant benefit to the countries. Of course, the traditional is how do we go about strengthening linkages between agriculture and tourism and also rural ecotourism promotion for the rural areas. We'd just like to mention we're currently working with CTA um, for a major, a major um, agro-tourism initiative with uh, EU funding, and we hope within the coming uh, year or two we'll be able to execute a number of agro-tourism projects in several Caribbean countries in that regard. Um, the two cross-cutting areas, very critical, and you heard a lot of reference to the use of modern technology and innovation. We believe in ICA that it is critical that we bring innovation and technology to bear on responding to some of the challenges and providing solutions to some of the long-term problems that we have been facing in the sector. And some of the things that we are seeking to utilize it for is to improve efficiencies in process, um, expand management capacities. Some of the things that we have been doing is helping build the capacity in 3D modeling, GIS, drone usage, in agriculture disaster risk management. We particularly use innovation and technology to enhance didactic and technology transfer capacities of, of institutions in the countries. ICA um, has been working as CGC. We have an agreement with Microsoft. We have launched the ICA Play platform, um, basically um, bringing agriculture knowledge, scientific information to help farmers, research institutions, educational institutions. Um, we have also launched with the government of Costa Rica what is Fabulad. How do we take this ICT, this modern technology, digital technologies, to bring it to bear in rural communities and in agriculture? These are available on, on our website, so please you feel free to go and see how to utilize the platform, how to engage. And basically, this for us is to what the, the Director General refer as an ECA 4.0, a renewed ECA where modern technology is utilized towards achieving higher efficiency in our technical cooperation agenda and, more ben and higher benefits for the member states. And of course, of critical importance, youth and women, which remain as vulnerable groups within the rural context and within our countries. And some of the things that we have been working here is strengthening governance of organizations, the promoting our culture in schools, supporting and promoting youth and women agri-entrepreneurship. Um, we, we will be launching a project on women access to markets in, for 2020. We are also looking at building capacities to formulate pro-youth women development policies. And most importantly, you would have seen it earlier, strengthening the regional mechanisms of the Caribbean Network of Women, Rural Women Producers, and also the Caribbean Agricultural Forum for Youth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Delis. Uh, if I could please call Dr. Renata Clark to do her presentation. Um, if you want to stay at your desk, you're welcome to, whichever, whichever you prefer. If it works from here, that works for me. Okay, good. <laughs> um, who's going to be handling the slides? As I've already said this morning once, this is my first planners forum, and I am still very happy to be here. And I suppose this is a good excuse uh, for me to say, 
I'm learning about what it is we need to be saying to each other most meaningfully in this time. I will learn and we will learn together how that conversation should evolve as our partnerships solidify. I am very conscious of the fact that my predecessors in this position have left very big shoes for me to fill. I am very conscious of the fact that FAO is a global knowledge organization that is serving a region with a number of highly capable regional organizations and agencies. I am conscious, therefore, that we, FAO, we have to plan very carefully to ensure that we are complementing and enhancing the national and regional ecosystem of agricultural expertise and not just crowding the space. In the way of this general chapeau for the substantive slides that will follow, I do want to clearly underline from the beginning that much of what we do, if not all, is in strong partnership with the various national and, and regional bodies. In terms of scope, I will be speaking to our support to policy making as well as to the implementation of policy. I flag that we are well placed to be ensuring consistency with international guidelines and recognized best practices. Another point that I would like to make is to underline that we see ourselves not only as ensuring that the Caribbean countries remain consistent with international agreements and guidelines, but that Caribbean countries are indeed more active in shaping those same agreements. We cannot leave it to others to set the rules that affect us. We heard very graphically this morning from the minister about our special circumstance. If we have special circumstances, we have to make them known and make sure that the rules are indeed appropriate to us as well. Speaking first in relation to climate change adaptation and resilient agriculture, FEO is involved in a number of ongoing and upcoming projects related to climate change adaptation and resilient agriculture. I don't intend to discuss them. If there are specific questions, we would be pleased to receive them. I underline once again that all of these projects are in full partnership with regional bodies. What I would like to highlight are elements of our approach in contributing to this area of work in the Caribbean. On the one hand, identifying and capitalizing opportunities to leverage technologies. I can give the example of the digital, digital capacities that are being strengthened to enhance early warning systems under the REACH project in St. Lucia and St. Vincent using global tools for efficient and quality project delivery. There are a number of examples that I can flag. FAO digital maps that are currently being utilized in a project in Belize on sustainable and resilient agriculture. FAO has developed damage and loss assessment methodologies. There was a regional training on this in Trinidad last week. We're working on agricultural insurance schemes in Grenada from which we could extract lessons that serve more broadly in the Caribbean. We have developed a tool for the review of climate change relevant legislation. Work on this has started in Antigua and Barbuda. You will be hearing more later today or tomorrow of newly developed agroecology assessment tool. We see ourselves as having a role in raising understanding and engagement in global processes. FAO had a big role in raising the awareness of the importance of agriculture in the global climate change debate. This resulted in the Cor Coronivia Joint Agreement. I'm not sure that the Caribbean is engaging adequately. I have requested our headquarters to support more training in the region to facilitate better engagement in the COP processes. There has also been, and will continue to be, quite a bit of training on accessing of climate finance. Fisheries. <laughs> we, 
while Vermran is struggling with the clicker, I'll just... <laughs> FAO plays a major role in fisheries governance globally, and we continue to be highly engaged in the fisheries sector development in the Caribbean in full partnership with the, the CRFM. We provide a secretariat for the Western Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission. FAO's knowledge basis and our neutrality are among the important characteristics for this role. There's a lot happening within WECAC. They have developed a 10-year regional plan to prevent and eliminate IUU. They have endorsed tools for data collection, which as we've said repeatedly already this morning, is essential for sustainable management of fisheries. And they have adopted management instruments for several uh, fisheries. There is considerable work focused on developing organizational capacity within fishery sectors for ecosystem stewardship and livelihoods of small-scale fisheries. This work is primarily funded through a JESS project that works with fisherfolk organization and governmental institution building, and most importantly, the interactions between the two. There's a lot of innovative value chain work. You will be hearing tomorrow about some novel investment models and approaches to public-private partnership for fisheries value chain development. We have also initiated work with support from the government of Argentina on the use of, of fish waste in silage. We will be expanding this work with support from CARDI. We expect to receive funding through the EU ACP program for value chain development in at least two more Caribbean countries next year. We are involved in some underlying analytical work on fish losses and sargassum that would contribute further information to guide policies and programs in this sector. Now I move on to the area of food and nutrition security. Do countries know where they stand in terms of food and nutrition security? Caribbean countries are generally underperforming in the reporting of statistics and in particular for those related to the tracking of SDGs. FEO is responsible for some of the related SDG indicators and we are planning further training and work with statistics offices around the region to improve data collection and reporting. I'm told that St. Lucia is the only country so far that has been reporting on the food insecurity experience scale, which is one of the indicators that's being monitored. We've put emphasis over the years on promoting healthy diets, primarily through review and updating of food-based dietary guidelines and through technical support to the design of school feeding policies and programs. We will be putting more emphasis in future going forward on building that solid information base to strengthen the design of programs and policies and that will enable monitoring of the impacts. In particular, we will be emphasizing food composition data. I noted AICA's work on, on biofortification, and I wonder about the information base for deciding what to be targeting. So this is something I would, I would like us to, to be speaking about together. We continue to work to establish parliamentary fronts against malnutrition and hunger. And here, I would like to emphasize, as I have been emphasizing with my own team, it's, it's great to have fronts, but having them is not enough. They need to work to be driving change, pushing through the various policy actions that are needed. There's growing appreciation that there needs to be a strong policy response to address obesity and NCDs. There's a lot of advocacy for front of pack labeling, protection of school environments and taxation, but there's a lot happening in the international sphere in which the Caribbean is not participating. Front of pack labeling is under discussion within Codex, but without Caribbean participation. Voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition are at an advanced stage in the World Committee on Food Security with little or no input from Caribbean. So we need to be at the table when the, these international discussions are being held value chains. There's a lot going on in value chains. We've already spoken about fishery value chain work, and you will be hearing in a short while about roots and tubers, and there's other work going on as well. 
Here, again, I'd like to put a focus on some of the approaches that we will be strengthening going forward. One is value chain analysis. We are emphasizing the building of capacities of countries to better plan value chain development strategies. This training involves a range of stakeholders in each country, including agricultural planning units. We're currently working in three countries, but according to the results, we're going to be using the me methodology much more broadly in our value chain technical assistance. We are in initiating the implementation of a UN-funded value chain project in five CARICOM countries that has a focus, that includes a focus on gender responsiveness and climate change resilience. We will be incorporating the value chain analysis in this set of work. We keep talking about competitiveness in agriculture, and one of the routes relates to aiming for more high value markets. Most of us cannot compete on volume and low cost. We need to find a space where we can make more money in agriculture. And along here, we'd like to be working with some of our partners to understand the space for more emphasis on specific quality and geographic, uh, yeah, geographic indications. Some small work is beginning in Antigua and Barbuda, but we're already exploring with partners where it might make sense to explore further. We've broached AICA in relation to the applicability to honey. We've been approached by ITC in relation to cocoa. I see that AICA is also active in that space. So spices seems to be a, a, a possible area. We need to keep the conversation going. Finally, to emphasize that value chains don't exist in a vacuum. If sanitary and phytosanitary measures are not well designed and implemented, markets can be lost. One of the projects we're currently involved in is a sour salt value chain project in Grenada, where I've learned that Grenada's competitive edge arises from the fact that you're pest free for a particular pest. So while we're dreaming up marketing strategies, let's make sure that we're marching hard on the ground to make sure that you have the capacities to keep Grenada pest free. This is a nice transition into the discussion on SPF and AMR. I know that AICA has been leading major projects in this region on, S on the SPS areas, and we have been collaborating in, collaborating in some of this work. FAO is now trying to be more proactive and strategic, even though resources are limited. Maybe governments haven't yet understood that investment here is critical. So I outline below where we are currently and what we plan in the near future. In relation to food safety, the motto of this year's, the first World Food Safety Day, is that food safety is everybody's business. We need to be working across the spectrum, institutions, national and regional, producers and the general public. So collaboratively, we need to be covering the spectrum in our programs. We are, at FAO, more emphatically incorporating food safety in our value chain work. We have plans, we're short of resources, but we'll be starting with a focus on building risk assessment and risk management capacity in countries to support CASPA's role in science-based harmonization of food safety requirements. We are leveraging our expert networks to be providing technical support to countries. We are currently preparing to put this in action in St. Kitts and Nevis, where they've asked for support on strengthening their national codex structures, and in Guyana, where we're working on food safety institutionalization. In the area of plant health, I know we've been the strong comrades of AICA in supporting CASPA and CPHD. We look forward to continuing to do that. And in addition, we have mobilized resources for a regional TCP to be dealing with PR4. And we will be working with CAPSA to be carrying out PCEs in at least four countries in the Caribbean, which should be the basis for a coherent and systematic approach to phytosanitary, uh, strengthening of phytosanitary systems. One thing I've noticed in my five months of being here is that AMR seems to be low on the awareness spectrum in the Caribbean, at least within the agriculture sector. The numbers from global reports are staggering. 
if antimicrobial management and use continue as they are currently, the projections are that by 2050, there will be 10 million deaths annually due to ineffective antimicrobial therapies. Developing countries will likely be disproportionately affected. The estimated global cost is around 100 trillion US dollars. PAHU is leading work in the health sector and they are su seeking support to make it a more One Health endeavor. We are preparing for some awareness videos with PAHO, and we're trying to sell a joint project to raise funds for AMR in the Caribbean, for fighting AMR in the Caribbean. There is some initial work planned on this in St. Kitts as well. Finally, in relation to trade and trade-related issues, there's a lot of interest in increasing interregional trade, but there are several irritants to this. FAO has proposed a regional project to facilitate this trade with a focus on addressing non-tariff measures and in improving transparency. We will be hearing more of this later this week. We are discussing with potential partners the design of a study that will examine the impact of food imports on nutrition. Our intention is for this to inform thinking about conducive policy framework for improved nutrition. There have been concerns expressed, strong concerns expressed, about the need to safeguard food security in the region. This is linked to the frequent disruptions in agriculture and in transport systems and logistics for the supply of food. We do need to understand what that means and how it intersects with trade-related policies. And from there, we need to understand how to protect legitimate national interests. FAO needs to figure out, together with you, how we can best support countries in the Caribbean on these issues. In closing, I would like to focus on two points that I've alluded to a few times in the course of this presentation. The first is that countries need better data and information on food and agriculture to enable better planning. We in the Caribbean cannot afford bad planning. We need to make the most of every opportunity. We will continue to work across subsectors to improve that situation and to strengthen the capacities of statistics offices. Secondly, partnership is key. It's a whole lot better to revel in shared success than to be the master of your own mediocre offerings. FAO will be working with the Caribbean countries to develop the program of work that we should be doing together beyond 2020 and I will endeavor to consult broadly with potential partners in coming up with our new country programming frameworks. Thank you, and I look forward to bilateral discussion. Dr. Kirk, you started out with a bang at your first uh, planners meeting. Thank you for a very uh, uh, thought-provoking um, presentation. I now call on Dr. Ben Adam of the CTA to present. <laughs> you seem to be surprised. Well, if we, we could uh, take your thoughts a, a little later then, when, when you have time to put them together then. Um, we don't have the Caribbean Development Bank with us as yet, and uh, similarly, uh, they will be given um, time to present, uh, if they so desire, um, when, when they reach. I believe it's today they're coming in. That then leaves us with a plenary session for about 20 minutes. Um, if we could try to focus the questions on the presentations made, that would be very helpful. Now, who wants to go first? 